Hey, Johns Hopkins, uh, can you hear me clearly? Good. Is anybody else here? Hmm? Oops. Okay. Well, I think it's 4 p.m. I guess uh, we'll get underway. So welcome back to the second lecture on neutron instrumentation, which is actually the 10th lecture in the course. Last time on Tuesday, we more or less covered information about neutron sources, moderators, some optical elements. What I'm going to try to do today is to actually apply what we used last time to illustrate how some representative instruments actually operate at both continuous sources and at pulsed sources. And this will give you some feeling for the considerations that go into choosing the right instrument for an experiment, and also some feeling, I hope, for what is measured and perhaps some of the pitfalls there. So uh, here is the outline, uh, slightly modified of these lectures, which shows, first of all, uh, what we covered last day, which I think is up here, more or less. Uh, optical elements, I'm not going to say anything about polarized neutrons, because Roger Pinn will give a couple of lectures that, is, that are more or less dedicated towards that. But I will mention some of these other issues more or less as we go along. So first of all, we're going to talk about elastic scattering, which I've put in parentheses diffraction. These are not exactly identical, but uh, I, will, I will explain a little bit more about that momentarily. And in particular, we'll look at powder diffractometers and how a powder diffractometer might operate in a continuous neutron source versus a pulsed neutron source. And I'll talk a little bit about small angle scattering. And I think the contrast will be interesting. And following that, uh, we'll say something about inelastic scattering uh, with a few, well, a couple of representative instruments. First of all, the triple axis spectrometer, which is the tried and true workhorse since the time of Bert Brockhaus and is used widely all over the world at reactors in various forms. And the Fermi chopper spectrometer, which is a direct geometry spectrometer in wide use at pulse neutron sources. If there is time, I'll give you a quick overview of some other instruments, uh, probably mostly at the pulse source. OK, so I'll remind you again of uh, the Nobel Prize that was awarded for the development of neutron scattering. And principally, the take home message here is that we use neutrons for two things. One, which is wistfully denoted here by where the atoms are, is the structure, the atomic structure of materials. And the second thing, uh, which is even more wistfully denoted as what the atoms do, is really the dynamics of materials. And the real point that is important about thermal neutrons, and for that matter, cold neutrons, is that the particle is a massive particle with a de Broglie wavelength of, roughly speaking, one angstrom or so and an energy of, roughly speaking, 10 to 30 milli-electron volts or so at the same time, right? Now, why is that important? It's important because in most materials, the distance between atoms is characteristically a few angstroms. And what we're often interested in understanding is the collective excitations of materials. In other words, what happens when all the particles are interacting and we get collective modes, and the energies of those modes typically are of the order of 10 to 30 milli-electron volts, which, as it happens, if you multiply by 11, which for my practical purposes here is equal to 10, in order to convert that to temperature uh, via Boltzmann's constant, that turns out to be sort of 100 to 300 Kelvin, very relevant temperature scales to real life. Okay, and again, I'll remind you of this conversion chart which, if you don't want to memorize, you should at least print out and keep handy if you ever want to do some of these experiments. Uh, and it's also useful for reading literature. 
Now, uh, again, here's a simple representative diagram of the neutron scattering experiment. So we know we have an initial momentum Ki, final momentum Kf vectors, right? Again, the uh, font here is messed up, for which I apologize. That's supposed to be a vector sign. The momentum transfer Q is Ki minus Kf. The energy transfer omega, again, h bar equals 1, is Ei minus Ef. When omega is equal to zero, we have elastic scattering. When omega is not equal to zero, we have inelastic scattering. Okay, so this is just a reminder of basic terminology that you already know. So now, in a moment, we will come back and look at powder diffraction. But first, I want to uh, switch to the smart board and um, show you a couple of notes here. Let's see. So I want to remind you of this. When we try to measure the structure of materials, what we're actually measuring is a correlation function, which uh, in our case, I've written down here as G of R and T. Okay, G is a statistical and thermal average of a density-density correlation function. We have written it here, where rho is the density at at uh, site 0 and time 0 on the left, and on the right, it's at site r, which is a vector in time t. I average that thermally and over configurations and statistically, et cetera, et cetera. I get this correlation function. And that has actually, with the time dependence, all the information about both the structure and the dynamics of the system. Okay, that's the thing that, that ultimately we want to know. When we do a scattering experiment, we are measuring the Fourier transform of this in space and time. And here, Q is just the momentum transfer, right? And omega is just the energy transfer that we defined on the previous page. So that's a correlation function that has all of the dynamics of the system. Now, for a moment, we're going to forget about dynamics and think about structure. So what is it that we actually want to measure when we measure structure? We have a system that has many atoms. In fact, uh, what we really want to measure is we want to measure diffraction, which is the integral of s of q and omega over all omega. Right? In other words, we want to sum up over all the energy. That's a well-defined quantity. The Fourier transform, inverse Fourier transform, if you like, of that quantity, s of q, is g of r, which is the static correlation function without regard to time. Now, what this corresponds to, of course, if I integrate over all time, right, excuse me, if I integrate over all omega, that corresponds, if you like, to time equals zero or fixed time. This is a snapshot of the system. That's the thing that I want to measure. On the other hand, there's a related quantity, which is s of q and omega equals zero. That's what's actually measured when you measure elastic scattering. And if you like, that's not a snapshot of the system. That's a long time average. Okay. What happens when you go to t equals infinity, things are just not moving. Now, here's something that you have to keep in mind with regard to neutrons. The neutrons that have wavelengths that are useful for this also have some energy that's 10 millivolts, 30 millivolts, maybe, uh, you know, in your wildest dreams, 100 millivolts, whatever. But if I measure something using neutrons of 30 millivolts, uh, I'm not able to integrate easily over all energies. Now, you contrast this with x-rays. If I have, say, copper K-alpha x-rays that have a wavelength of 1.5 angstroms, okay, which would be equivalent to a neutron of, I don't know, say 40 millivolts, very round number speaking, okay, that x-ray photon will have an energy of 10 kilovolts. So if I measure neutron scattering and I, I try and measure diffraction, I'm only going to integrate up to roughly more or less what the energy of the incident neutron is, you know, some or some fraction thereof if I'm trying to do elastic scattering. And if I do it with x-rays, you know, kilovolt compared to a millivolt, that's a factor of 10 to the 9, <laughs> right? You can see I integrate over a much wider energy window. And in fact, if I do x-ray scattering or x-ray diffraction, I really am measuring diffraction 
in the sense that uh, I write down here, to a very, very good approximation. But that is not necessarily true with neutrons. And that's something that one needs to keep in mind. Okay. Second point. Uh, what we are actually measuring, which here I'll call the observed intensity. Of course, we know that this is going to be a, a cross-section, more or less. Now, the cross-section contains the correlation function, which could be the density-density correlation function as I've written on the previous page, albeit modified by neutron scattering strength. Right? It could be a magnetic correlation function or some term in the magnetic correlation function, which, as you know, is actually a tensor. But whatever it is, I'm going to measure something and I'm going to observe it. Now, uh, this observed, measured set of neutron counts isn't exactly the same as the theoretical cross-section. Okay? First of all, there's a statistical uncertainty. And you probably know this. If I have n counts, counting statistics are plus 1 statistics. right? So that's going to be plus or minus, if I write as one standard deviation, approximately the square root of n. And I think probably everybody's familiar with this. If you're not, uh, you should go perhaps and read up on it. And also, um, maybe when you look at your next newspaper poll, 50 people were asked such and such a question. Right, you can get a quick estimate of the uncertainty. Anyway, we have statistical uncertainty. But more than that, what we measure is not the exact theoretical cross-section. What we measure is that theoretical cross-section convolved with an instrumental resolution function. If I try and measure something, just do this elastic experiment, I have a ki, I have a kf, both of those are a little bit uncertain. Angles aren't perfectly defined. Wavelengths aren't perfectly defined. So uh, I have some net effect that there's an instrumental resolution function, okay, which I point to here. And what I actually measure is this convolution integral. So I measure something i of 2 and omega. It's this convolution integral of the resolution with the theoretical cross-section. Plus, I may have background neutrons that hit the counter that are just coming from something completely different. You know, the ball of wax sitting in the other corner of the room, or you know, hydrogen in the ceiling or whatever. So part of our job as experimentalists is to, first of all, make sure that the resolution is such that we can accurately get the necessary information in order to determine the structure, number one. And number two, minimize the background, or at least measure the background and model it in a way that is actually reliable, given the statistical uncertainties, so that we can get at the information that we're actually requiring to get at. Okay, so these are considerations that we ought to keep in mind. So now I'm going to go back to the PowerPoint, and you'll forgive me for a moment uh, while I try to share the right document here. OK, let's see. So as long as I'm here, um, do we have any questions so far? Or is more or less clear. Okay, if there are questions, just you know, type all capitals in your chat box or something. Eventually, I may notice them, or somebody here may notice them and, and scream. Right. So let's talk about powder diffraction first of all. Okay, what is powder diffraction? Well, I, I'm assuming everybody here more or less is familiar with it, right? Uh, we can do diffraction off single crystals. Uh, it turns out that very often it's convenient when one can't get a single crystal to diffract off something that's polycrystalline or powder, where I have a lot of little crystals that are averaged over all orientations. And this is something that we know how to interpret and we know how to model it very well. And I believe everybody here is, let's go to the full screen. Everybody here is familiar with, with Bragg's Law, which we can write in various different forms. I've chosen just for now to write it in this form. Right, so if I have neutrons or photons or whatever, a wavelength lambda, and I have uh, spacings of atoms corresponding to D, of course, I get strong diffraction when I satisfy this equation. Now, again, as I mentioned before, what ideally one wants to measure is diffraction, which is integrated over energy transfer. But normally, and this is not always true, but it's often true, in fact, I will say usually true, 
the term that happens to be elastic, at omega equals zero, dominates the diffraction. Okay. And what happens in practice is that we make the assumption that if I measure this elastic term or I measure the diffraction, I'm getting something that one is proportional to the other. Now, there's a big caveat here. This is not always true. So, uh, you know, if you're going to analyze data and try to figure out structures, right, you have to know when this is true and when it isn't. But in practice, for powder diffraction, we are generally assuming that it is true, especially in a system that has Bragg peaks. Okay, well, how do we do this kind of experiment? Obviously, in order to get information out in a reliable way and satisfy this equation, we need to know lambda and we need to know the scattering angle, right? And what we're trying to figure out, if you like, is D or a set of Ds that lets us know where the atoms in the material are sitting. So at a steady state source, if you'll recall, we have neutrons coming out all the time, and they're basically, in a reactor, it's like a big gas bottle full of neutrons, and we've poked a hole in the side, and out comes more or less some Maxwellian spectrum of neutrons, the ones we want to use, and then some others that we don't want to use. Well, if we're going to that, that Maxwellian spectrum, you can think of as white or at least pink. It's got many, many, many wavelengths. So if we're going to do diffraction and know what the wavelength is, we have to down-select. So we pick one wavelength. How do we do this? Generally, we stick a crystal in the path of the beam and we brag diffract from it. It has to be a crystal that we know very well. So we know what the D spacing is. And we can pick the angle. And then we get out one wavelength, plus or minus some spread. Okay, so then we have some detector at an angle theta, and we can put the detector on an axis and turn theta to vary the angle, or we can have many detectors, or we can have a position-sensitive detector and measure many angles at once. But the point is, we have to monochromate the beam in order to choose one lambda. Now, now pulse sources allow one to do something a little bit different. And you'll see right away where the advantage is. If I have a pulse of neutrons, okay, that pulse is also a sort of pink beam once I shape it. It has many wavelengths. As it travels on its way to the sample, the fast neutrons have, which with short wavelengths are getting ahead of the slow neutrons with long wavelengths. And the pulse is spreading out in time. And I can use a stopwatch and time them and thereby get the energy, the wavelength, the velocity, whatever you like, right? So if I bin the detector, the detected neutrons into different time slots, and I assume that the scattering is elastic, I know the path lengths, I know the time it should take for a neutron of a given wavelength, and I can use all of them. And I've resolved them by, by looking at time. Okay, so that's the, the principal difference between them. So let's, uh, again, look in a little more detail. So here's the steady state neutron source. And here's a typical Maxwellian spectrum and uh, some typical values to the left of that for different temperatures, which you might have on a thermal or cold source. And epithermal neutrons are things that we don't have too much of at reactors, but certainly there are um, plenty of them at pulse sources. And again, we will define this by some sort of Bragg diffraction to get a single wavelength. Okay, here's a typical schematic instrument. Okay, so we have neutrons, in this case, coming here, right? And uh, they are Bragg-reflected, or Bragg-diffracted, if you like, by a monochromator. And around this, we have shielding, except for one particular location, right? So we take out a Bragg-reflected beam at one angle, and now it's pretty much monochromatic. Okay, well, what happens then? If we're doing the experiment properly, um, we want to make sure that any fluctuations in the source intensity or uh, et cetera can be accounted for. So we usually use a monitor counter, which is a very inefficient neutron counter that gives us a signal proportional to the neutron flux in the beam. Uh, we use various masks or collimators that allow us to, first of all, block down the size of the beam so we're illuminating the sample and not all the other stuff that's holding the sample in place, which will also send neutrons into the counter that are background as far as we're concerned. And uh, moreover, we can use collimators to sort of tune the angular divergence in this beam so that we can tune the resolution function. 
A will typically have a sample. That sample may be in some sort of sample environment. So this would be a furnace or a cryostat or whatever. We control that. And finally, I've written here, well, we have a, a filter. <laughs> okay. Why do we have a filter? We'll get to that in a minute. Um, by the way, the filter doesn't have to be placed here. It might be placed here. It might be placed there. Uh, this was just a schematic that I happened to find in Water Montfrey's book. But uh, the reason for the filter is the same in any case, and we'll get to that in a moment. And finally, we have a detector. And not shown is the enormous amount of shielding that must surround the detector, which otherwise, with the reactor turned off and everybody at home in bed between cycles, will be merely counting away from cosmic rays and every other source. Okay. So this is just a standard diffractometer. Okay, well, here's a, a direct diagram of the first practical neutron powder diffractometer, which was used by Ernie Wallen, who started the whole thing, and Cliff Scholl. And uh, this is one of the very first papers where they measured, where they published neutron diffraction by powders. And you can see there's a powder pattern for graphite and one for diamond. Since these are both just elemental carbon, the difference in that diffraction pattern has to be due to the location of the atoms, right? They were showing neutrons could be used for this purpose. And this was done at the old X10 graphite reactor at Oak Ridge National Laboratory. It's probably hard to uh, read these diagrams carefully, but as a monochromator crystal, they were using sodium chloride. If you can imagine trying to use a big sodium chloride crystal in Tennessee, where, of course, it's never humid and nothing could happen, that's what they were using. And uh, they had a defined beam that came out, hit a sample, and, and the beam bounced into a detector. The detector could pivot around an axis, and they could vary it. And you know, this allowed them to sit at different angles and count neutrons. Okay. Now, I'm not going to go into the details of all the correction factors that one has to apply to these peaks to, to use this information. But that's something that you can go and read for yourselves. If it's not covered elsewhere in the course, you might want to read about Riedfeld refinement and, and various programs that exist, like GSAS or FullProf, and try and understand something about the resolutions and so forth. That's a little bit beyond the scope of, of just this lecture. But uh, here, just for some grins, this is a picture of sort of the first diffractometer that was installed by Ernie Wallen back in 1946. And, uh, you know, this is the detector sitting in here. So this is a long, it's a proportional counter. They were actually using uh, BF3 gas then, which we don't like to use anymore because it's, let's just say, one whiff of it is a lot worse for you than a whiff of helium-3. Um, but uh, you can see the large volume here. So they had a good chance of detecting the neutrons. And, and you know, this is a fairly early apparatus. Actually, Woolen had been a student of Arthur Compton's, learned all about x-rays and brought some previously used x-ray apparatus from University of Chicago down to Oak Ridge and uh, adopted it for neutrons. And subsequently, he worked with Cliff Scholl starting after World War II. And now you can see they've got something that's a lot fancier. Okay, and this is where a lot of the published data was produced. This was still at the graphite reactor. So here's the location of the monochromator. And you can see it's now pretty well shielded to knock down the background. They thought a lot about that. They also have some pieces here, which are acting as masks and collimators and shaping the beam. So they well defined the beam volume area that, and the volume of the sample that was illuminated. And the detector shielded better. And they have a nice cantilever here. And this worked very well. And by the way, there are pictures that show Ernie Wallen smoking a pipe. But that's not actually a cigar in Cliff's mouth. It's actually, I think, something sitting on the piece of apparatus behind him. But that's a powder diffractometer in the old days. OK, well, monochromators, I'll, I'll just quickly show this. You can look it up later. Um, you know, one chooses a monochromator according to what is needed. And uh, that depends on what range of wavelengths you want, um, what other considerations are there, what strength of signal. And you'll notice here. Uh, this absence of second order for silicon. Those of you who remember solid state physics from Cattell probably know that silicon 111 actually strongly scatters, and silicon 222, in principle, does not. Right? So one thing that is true of any crystal is that if I have a uh, 
an HKL Bragg peak that reflects neutrons or X-rays. In general, any integer multiple also might reflect neutrons or X-rays, unless it happens to have a vanishing structure factor by symmetry. So what that means is when I set up a crystal monochromator and I'm trying to get out a certain wavelength lambda, if you like, I get not just lambda, but I get lambda by 2, lambda by 3, lambda by 4. Or if you think in k space, I get ki, 2ki, 3ki. Or for neutrons, if I think in energy space, I get e naught, 4 e naught, 9 e naught, etc. Right. So what I get is basically the diffracted beam plus its harmonics. And usually I don't want the harmonics. That's why we have filters. Okay. Uh, here's a picture of a, a typical monochromator. Now, these monochromators can be flat-faced crystals. They can be curved. Um, I'm not going to go into detail here, but this was a cleverly built curved monochromator that focused the beam down at the sample in such a way as it could still be interpreted when it was unfocused at the detector. Uh, that's printed in Wouter's book, and I'll let you read about it there. So let's see, let's now talk about this filter. Okay. So we have various ways to get rid of the unwanted harmonics. One way is to pick a crystal like silicon in the 111 reflection that gets rid of the second order. That does, however, leave the third order behind. Another way is to filter the beam in some way. So I'll talk about two kinds of filters. The most common one that's used is, is graphite. Now, it turns out if I take pyrolytic graphite, highly oriented pyrolytic graphite, uh, this is something that's basically crystalline in one direction. Graphite has a hexagonal structure, and the C direction or L axis in pyrolytic graphite is very well defined with even spacings, and the AB plane or the hexagonal planes are more or less powder. So I have something that's a good crystal in one direction. It turns out it's a great neutron monochromator. It can also be used if you stack it up as a filter. Well, why is that? Uh, well, the, the, the true answer is it's complicated, but the simplest sort of basic principle is if I have some beam shining straight on this graphite, okay, everywhere I would happen to have a 180 degree Bragg scattering angle that corresponds to one of these spacings, the beam gets reflected right back. Therefore, it doesn't get transmitted very easily. Right? So the transmission of those special locations is very, very low. So what I can do if I want to get rid of harmonics is I can pick an incident wavelength where the transmission of its higher order multiples or fractionals, whatever you want to call it, is very low. So here's measured transmission through a certain length of graphite. So if lambda is the wavelength that I wish to use, the red line here, okay, this shows the transmission of neutrons of wavelength lambda. Now, it's actually plotted as a function of energy, so you have to do the conversion. But you can see for 15 millivolt neutrons or 14 millivolt neutrons, the lambda gets transmitted very well. Okay, the black curve here is lambda by 2, and the green curve is the transmission for lambda by 3. And you can see that if I happen to pick 14 or 15 millivolt neutrons, the transmission of lambda by 2 or lambda by 3 is very low. So if that's a convenient wavelength for me to use in a diffraction experiment, I can use any monochromator I want, produce neutrons of those wavelengths, run them through a graphite filter, basically for this kind of experiment at any point, and lo and behold, I'll get a much cleaner beam. And I can trade off, basically, intensity for clean cleanliness of the beam by making the filter thicker or whatever. Now, you'll notice the way I describe this. It does depend on the orientation of the filter, and that is true. These filters have to be tuned a little bit. Okay, that may not be anything uh, you would ever have to do as a user, but if you really get into this you know, in shirt sleeves and shorts and mucking around, it's something you might have to do. Now, here's another kind of filter, which operates on a different principle. This is called a cutoff filter, and I illustrate now the uh, transmission of neutrons of a certain energy through some thickness of, in one case, beryllium, and in another case, just a powder of diamond. And what you can see is that for long wavelengths, which is low energies, actually this transmission is pretty good. 
And then in both cases, suddenly you hit a sharp drop. Okay. Now these filters are not using something that's highly oriented. They're just polycrystalline material or powders. How are they working? Well, if you think about it, if I have neutrons that have a wavelength longer than the largest D spacing, give or take a factor of two or whatever, than the largest D spacing in the material, those neutrons don't Bragg reflect. So if I shine them on the material, they'll go through except for some absorption or small angle scattering or whatever. On the other hand, if I have a thick enough powder, if there's any reflection that they can be Bragg reflected out, they'll get Bragg reflected out on the way in. And so that's what you see. Here's diamond, which is, turns out is particularly clean. Okay, and the neutrons get transmitted until they hit the D spacing corresponding to the lowest index diamond peak, which, by the way, you may all know what that is from reading Baby Cattell, but you can work out whether it corresponds to this energy in your mind or not. That would be a good little exercise. And then you can see, boom, the transmission drops. So when is this useful? Well, if I want to use relatively long wavelength neutrons, okay, like in a cold source or something, I can get rid of all the short wavelength neutrons using this method. Now, beryllium is actually the most commonly used filter. And in practice, uh, you have to make it in a special way that avoids problems with multiple scattering and also cool it down in order to avoid losing the neutrons because they make phonons and scatter out or whatever. But these are uh, effectively ways of getting rid of the higher order harmonics. And they're used. So here's a, uh, a, a more modern cartoon of a, of a powder diffractometer. This one happens to be at the Institut Laue Langevin. So now you can see, you know, we have constructed this so we share neutron beams with more than one instrument. There's a selection of monochromators on a little wheel here, um, well-defined collimations, various apertures to shape the beam. Everything's all built nicely together. And uh, the detector is a position-sensitive detector, which we talked a little bit about last time. So we can collect many angles at once. But we still have to use a monochromatic beam. Okay. Um, here's just some pictures of some typical, say, collimators. And actually, over here, this is a, a radial collimator. If you have a curved PSD detector or something, you might want to have a radial collimator and actually oscillate it so it averages out places where you have shadows from the collimator blades. Uh, here's you know, just some other powder diffractometers. This one doesn't show up too well, I don't think. But uh, at least as I'm looking at it, it doesn't show up too well. But this is these are from Missouri. This one has a, a sort of linear PSD. Uh, here's one at NIST that has a curved array of detectors. And these are very common instruments. They're used all over the world. Here's a cartoon of the HB2A powder diffractometer that's at Heifer. So again, you can see there's the, the instrument shutter, a big shield housing the detector, which is very, very important, a table for the sample, beam stop, which is there for uh, safety and the radiological background in the room. And now here's a photograph of the same thing, okay, which you see on the instrument sheet. Now, these instrument sheets, you can go to www, well, neutrons. There's no www in that one. Neutrons.ornl.gov. You can look up all this different information. And you'll see typically uh, it tells you what the monochromator is. So you can work out D spacings, what monochromator angles are available, the wavelengths that are typically used, the range of scattering angles, what collimations are there, et cetera. And of course, this is at the Oak Ridge site for this instrument, but it's also at all the other sites for the other instruments. OK, well, um, let me point out one other aspect of this that one should be aware of. Okay. So we're doing this experiment. We're trying to measure scattering as a function of q. And ki is equal to Q plus KF is just conservation of momentum. And the spectrometers that I've showed you there, basically, they're essentially two axis spectrometers. Okay. What that means, there's one axis that's a monochromator. There's another axis that's a scattering angle from the sample. And that means that if I have a KI and I have a KF going into a detector, let me think for a minute of a detector at that angle. And what happens if the neutrons that are scattered towards that detector 
uh, are not scattered elastically. If they're scattered elastically, Ki and Kf, of course, have the same length. But if they're scattered inelastically, you know, here's my sample. If it's scattered inelastically, then I still scatter into the detector. But Kf has a different length. And what that means is that the actual Q will be different, right? So if I have a two-axis spectrometer of the type that I'm using, this is just a sort of caveat emptor that you need to know. The stuff that's scattered there inelastically, not only do you, are you not able to integrate over it necessarily very well, but in fact, it actually is scattering at a different wave vector. So it really is important, what I said before, that the elastic scattering dominates the signal. Okay. So this is something, again, one should keep in mind. Okay. Now let's go back and let's think about how all of this works if we're using a time of flight instrument. OK, in the meantime, let me just check. Are there any questions? OK, seeing, seeing none, no questions in the local audience. At least I see a few people in the local audience who are awake. That's a good sign. I hope somebody out there is still awake, too. Um, OK, so let me remind you of something very simple, right? Neutrons are particles and they're waves. And if I have long wavelength neutrons, right, they're slow. And if I have short wavelength neutrons, they're fast, right? So uh, what I mentioned before about using the time of flight allows us to separate wavelengths. So again, we remember that in a pulsed neutron source, okay, sorry, I should have made that full screen before, but in a pulsed neutron source, Okay, first of all, the, the pulse shape is determined largely by the moderator. And second of all, when the pulse travels down, it spreads out in time, and that's also the same as spreading out in wavelength. And basically, if I have a pulse source diffraction instrument, um, I have a beam that starts out, which, let's see, here's the beam. And that's actually a little rainbow to show that it's got many different wavelengths. And now as it moves along, you can see the rainbow is spreading out. And now it's spreading out some more. And it's spreading out some more. And it's spreading out some more. And it's spreading out some more and some more. And eventually, when it gets to the sample, if it's traveled a large enough distance, right, I can use a stopwatch and I can get very good resolution. And in one detector, I can measure all of these different wavelengths just by using a stopwatch. Okay, well, how true is that? Uh, it's, it's pretty true, uh, subject to a couple of caveats. Okay, what are those? Well, here's a more complete cartoon of a powder diffractometer. Um, this actually even corresponds to PowGen. Uh, I realized I probably have to put these on to look, <laughs> to look at this. But um, so you can see we start out with a source, which we just label as the moderator here. That's the effective source. All of these instruments have shutters, so you can close the beam in case you need to work on them. And the first thing you see here is something called a T0 chopper. Well, what's up with that? If you remember the spectrum that came from the pulse source, most of it, or a lot of it, is moderated. And it comes out in this pink beam that we just saw spreading out in the rainbow. But there's a good fraction that isn't moderated. Right? So the stuff that isn't moderated, these are neutrons that have energies of megavolts. right? So megavolts, 10 to the 6 electron volts, and we're comparing that to the neutrons we want, or you know, 10 or 100 milli-electron volts or something. And uh, OK, the velocity goes like the square root of that, but that's still a lot of zeros. And when we take the square root of that, we realize that these neutrons are just flying down enormously quickly when the neutron pulse is created. And given what is normally the time resolution, these things all would arrive at the sample at time t equals 0. So what we do is we take some kind of interference that blocks the beam right at the point where the protons are hitting the target. And we eliminate this huge zero pulse of unmoderated fast neutrons. So that's what this T0 chopper is for. It gets the background down. So then the next thing is we have some things here called bandwidth choppers. Well, what are bandwidth choppers? Well, what they are is they're sort of a fairly open disk that's made of neutron absorbing material. And there's at least two of them here. And they can rotate or counter rotate uh, 
in such a way as the two openings are congruent for some length of time, and that lets some fixed fraction of the rainbow go through where we know the beginning and we know the end. Okay, why is that important? Well, if we let the whole rainbow go through, the really, really slow neutrons from the first pulse are going to be lapped and passed by the fast neutrons or faster ones from the second pulse. We know this in Tennessee because everybody watches NASCAR, right? I have, like, I have a room full of NASCAR fans here. I can just see it, right? So there are people are getting lapped. So we don't, we don't want that. That's not allowed in neutron diffraction. So we have bandwidth choppers. Okay. So we have to define that. And uh, now I also have a guide. We talked about guides last time. The real reason for the guide here is we want the angular divergence of the incident neutron beam to be as large as is reasonably possible without messing up the resolution in order to get the maximum number of neutrons on the sample. And uh, you know, then at the end, we have a sample position and we have a great big whopping detector. Okay, here's some pictures, just to put it in perspective. This thing here is a, uh, an example of a T0 chopper. So you can see it's just a big block of absorbing stuff that's got to be thick and heavy and blocks the fast neutrons. And, and here's what uh, you know, a set of disk choppers might look like. Okay. So those would be typically used for frame overlap. Um, here's a picture of a detector array. Now, the detector array is another thing that's kind of interesting. The way it's laid out geometrically can really affect the ultimate resolution of these instruments. Typically, for a spallation source powder diffractometer, we want delta D over D to be constant for all the different Ds. And so that requires some thought about the geometry. This is the GEM instrument, which is used at ISIS. And it's one of the outstanding powder diffractometers in the world. There's a schematic. That's the sort of sample area there. And here's actually a, a photograph of it. And uh, our local champion for powder diffraction at the Splation Neutron Source is called POWGEN. It's on beamline 11A. Here's a picture of the detector array. Um, here's a picture of the area, the sample area. Actually, the sample is loaded from above and is down below. And sort of here's an overall picture of that. And uh, you can see the detector array. And now we've got a little person in there. And for anybody who's visited there or will visit there, up here is the hutch where you actually sit with a computer and look at the data as it comes in. Okay. So the take home message from this is actually under normal circumstances, because the pulse source can use more or less the entire spectrum, right? and the reactor source has to throw away most of it, Pulse sources are just fabulous for powder diffraction under normal circumstances. And it's very hard to beat one if a, if a powder diffractometer is well constructed. OK, are there any questions about this before I move on? Yes. <laughs> Somebody has asked me, what does POWGEN actually stand for? Well, POW is uh, for powder. And I think the original name was POW Gen 3, and it stood for Generation 3. But I think between the time that was proposed and now, you know, we've had Generation X and Generation this and that, and somehow the 3 just got dropped, and you can fill it in with whatever you want. Um, at least that's what I believe it stood for. There's, there will probably be somebody who will correct me on that. OK, but a good question. Other questions? OK, well, three is only a number, but sometimes <laughs> numbers can mean different things to different people. OK, let's, let's move on to a slightly different kind of instrument. In this case, we'll, we'll talk about small angle scattering. Uh, it turns out that there's a nice resource at NIST that was created by uh, Hamuda. He's got an online SANS toolbox and also some lectures. So if you're interested in small angle scattering, that's definitely worth checking out. OK, so what is small angle scattering? Well, it is simply diffraction, or if you like, elastic scattering at very, very small angles. Here's another way of writing Bragg's law, right? And if I have very small angles, that means that uh, k here is 2 pi over lambda, right? I'm, I'm going to be measuring small q. That means large distances. So in a typical crystal, atoms are a few angstroms apart. 
But if I have something like a protein, right, or a polymer, I have sort of structures on length scales that are hundreds or thousands of angstroms. Uh, those are macromolecules, say. But I also have things that happen in condensed matter physics that, that have similar kinds of scales. So for example, if I have maybe a binary alloy or something that phase separates, right, the regions of one phase and the other, they may have sizes of hundreds or thousands of angstroms. They will have different neutron scattering length densities. And if I do a diffraction experiment, that will show up. Um, if I have, let's see, here we have a font conversion problem. That's not a lie. It actually said IE with something, <laughs> with a little symbol there. But uh, OK, well, the presidential debate was last night, so draw whatever conclusions you want. Um, if I have a superconductor with a flux line lattice, right? the typical spacing of these flux line lattices in typical fields is hundreds of angstroms. Neutrons scatter magnetically from those. I can see those in a small angle scattering experiment. Uh, skirmion lattices, which I know is of interest to some people, sort of magnetic domain patterns that are set up. I can see things like that at very large distances that wouldn't work in a powder diffractometer. But basically, I can construct a device like this. I have a neutron source, by which we mean a moderated source. I have some kind of collimation system, which is typically a set of pinholes. I have a sample. And then I typically have an area detector. Okay. So uh, let's think about some consideration there. And now I'm going to switch to the whiteboard for a moment. Okay. Um, well, here's again, uh, you know, Bragg's law written out in some fashion. And let's see. Again, I'll make this full screen so it's a little bigger. So here's Bragg's law. I haven't bothered to write Q as a vector now. I've just written Q as a scalar. Okay, so I'm assuming this is powder-like or whatever. So Q equals 2K sine theta, or this is often written sine phi by 2, or 4 pi over lambda sine theta. Uh, let's think about the resolution for a second in the sense that we think about the uncertainties in, in these quantities. Okay, basically there are two terms in the uncertainty for Q, if I just think about its magnitude. Okay, the first term is coming from the wavelength spread. Okay, so delta Q over Q squared, these two different sources of uncertainty add in quadrature. Okay, so these two things are here. And the second term comes from the fact that uh, the scattering angle isn't well defined necessarily, right? There's a certain size of the beam and a certain uncertainty in that. So there's a term here, the first one, is coming from the wavelength spread, and the second one is coming from the angular collimation. Now, let's stare at these for a second. What happens if I am trying to go to very small angles, right? Which of these terms is going to dominate? I don't know if anybody out in the internet land wants to say, uh, just enter term one or term two if you want to answer that online. Or if you're in here, you can hold up two fingers. At small angles, which term will dominate, number one or number two? So number one is wavelength spread. So you're going for wavelength spread. OK, well, take a look at term two. I don't see anybody on the internet actually responding, so take your time. Um, what happens to sine theta as theta goes to zero? So what happens to term two? It blows up, right? So actually. It's term two that is going to dominate. So if I want to measure something at very small angles, I can afford to have a rather large delta lambda or a rather large delta k, right? Because basically the resolution or the sloppiness in the resolution is going to be more or less dominated by the uncertainty in the measured angle, right? So this allows me. To, and I'm switching back to PowerPoint now, so please bear with me. Uh, OK, there we go. So this allows me to, to make use of, of that fact right, by taking a very large wavelength band. Now, that's one point. The other point is I want to measure large distances. Okay. I do that best if I use large wavelengths. That means I want slow neutrons, which means cold neutrons. And given that a reactor has a time average flux that's large compared to the time average flux of a spallation source, 
And given that the neutrons that are emanating from the beam hole in the reactor are much more completely moderated, typically, than the neutrons coming from a pulse source, a reactor can give me a very large flux of cold neutrons. And if I'm not throwing them all away, I can keep a wide bandwidth. I can get a tremendous, tremendous signal from the reactor if I'm concentrating on very small angles. Right? So, that, so typically, whereas powder diffraction, it's sort of obvious in some sense that there's usually an advantage at a pulse source. For small angle scattering, conversely, there's usually an advantage at a reactor. Now, I say usually because uh, there are situations where that's not really the case. So here you see a slightly more detailed, if you like, uh, picture of one of these small angle scattering instruments. Um, this just shows a monochromatic neutron beam. We'll talk about what that means and how we get it in a second in one of these instruments, typically an aperture that's defined by some pinholes, a uh, scattered beam on a sample. And typically, this uses a two-dimensional area detector, which might be, a, say, a crossed wire detector that I didn't actually discuss in detail last time, but it's a PSD going in two directions, and you can read up on them. Okay. Uh, here's a cartoon. Now, the monochromatic or monochromating device here is not a crystal. It is something called a velocity selector, which is working on a principle that's closer to the disk choppers that you just saw, but a little different. And it's a, it's very sloppy. Uh, question here, yes? So, Well, you have to, if the neutrons are slow enough, that's something that has to be accounted for, and it is accounted for in software. So, I mean, the, the answer is it depends on the details, but yes, that, that is a factor. Um, but that's going to go beyond the scope of, of this lecture, I think. <laughs> but that's a very good question. Okay, I'm sorry, I'll repeat the, the question. Uh, thank you, I just got a note to do that. The question was, given that we're using cold neutrons which move slowly, and given that we have relatively long flight paths, does gravity become an important effect? Because the neutrons travel along, and obviously they're falling because they have mass. And the answer is yes. Under some circumstances, it's important, and it needs to be corrected for. Uh, OK, here you see from above, that's a picture, I think, of the one of the small angle scattering machines at NIST as it was under construction. And basically, here in the foreground, you sort of see a long flight path. Typically, these will have guides. They will be evacuated. They'll have apertures. And then back here, there's a big tank with a detector in it. Okay. Now, the velocity selector essentially is something that kind of looks like this. Neutrons are, are coming kind of in this direction. And we have a bunch of neutron-absorbing blades of some length. And this thing rotates around. And it rotates around this axis. And if you think about it for a second, if that thing is rotating, only neutrons of a certain velocity spread will be able to get through that hole without hitting one of the blades, depending how fast it rotates. Right? And you can also tilt it to change the way the neutrons see it. And using one of these, you can define to within some fairly generous wavelength spread the velocity of the neutrons. So here's a picture of, of one of these guys. This happens to be one that's used in Australia at ANSTO. They had a nice picture out there. Here's a cartoon that, again, shows a little more detail. You would have a guide, <coughs> one of these velocity selectors, some uh, irises, you know, holes of a certain size to collimate the beam. And typically, you would use this sort of two-dimensional position-sensitive detector. Okay. Um, here's a picture of, actually, there are two small angle scattering instruments at Heifer. And these are so-called, uh, this, this one is a, uh, has got a 30 meter, if you like, flight path. And basically, it looks the same as that thing you saw at NIST. You know, there's some guides and apertures and a position for the sample. And then there's a long tank here. And you can see another nearly identical instrument beside it. That happens to be CG3. And if I take a look over here, you can see that the max, well, here's the beam spectrum. OK, lambda can go from 4 to 25 angstroms. And delta lambda over lambda can be tuned anywhere from 9 to 45%. Right, so that's a huge spread. So you're getting tons and tons of neutrons. All right? And uh, the maximum 
flux on sample happens to be for delta lambda over lambda equals 14%. And you can see here's the, the range of momentum transfer, which unfortunately was cut off there, but there's sort of, uh, well, you can see 7 times 10 to the minus 4 up to 1 inverse angstrom. Now, how you actually achieve that, in fact, is the detector. Here's the detector containers, which you see here actually one opened up and somebody's standing there beside the detector. The detector is mounted on a track in vacuum and it can slide forward and back. Right? So if it's all the way forward, the detector has a certain pixel size. You'll cover a large angular range but with a worse resolution because the pixel size corresponds to a bigger solid angle. If the detector is all the way at the back, you'll cover a smaller total angle range but you'll, go to a you'll have a better angular resolution and you can get to smaller angles. Okay, so again, very well suited to a reactor. And uh, conversely, here's a picture of uh, the instrument page for EQSENS, which is Beamline 6 at S and S. And this is now operating again basically the same way as the powder diffractometer that I mentioned before, right? You have to define <laughs> some wavelength by using a stopwatch. And this kind of limits somewhat the flexibility of the instrument, and because uh, the neutrons are not completely moderated, right, here you're using a supercritical hydrogen moderator as a source, which means they are called neutrons, but a lot of the neutrons actually don't get moderated, and, and we're using a little less of the spectrum than we would be able to at a reactor. Okay, now the thing about EQ sense, EQ stands for extended Q. Obviously, this allows you to go in the same instrument rather easily to, over, to cover a larger Q range. So if you want to do something where you want to get small distances as well as large distances at the same time, there might be a real advantage to using this instrument EQ SAS. Okay, so again, it depends on the experiment you want to do where, where there's advantages, and these both work really well. But if you want to do really small angle scattering, it's hard to beat a cold source instrument at a reactor. All right, uh, I'm going to move on now to triple axis spectrometers, but I'll stop here in case there are any questions about diffraction or small angle scattering. Any, any questions from the internet? I feel like I'm running a live auction here or something with internet bidders, but nobody's bidding, so I'm losing money. Okay. All right, well, let's now start talking about what the atoms do. Okay, here's the prototypical instrument for measuring excitations in a material with neutron scattering. And that is the triple axis spectrometer. And the triple axis spectrometer, uh, as you're all aware, was invented by this guy, Bert Brockhaus, who uh, built the first one at Chalk River back in the late 1950s and early 1960s. He made a lot of measurements at the NRU reactor. Uh, Brockhaus had been in the Canadian Navy during World War II, so he actually had a very good source of, uh, of, of sort of round things that could define angles with high precision. It turned out to be the gun turrets from the Canadian Navy, <laughs> which were being surplused at that time. And if you go and see his original spectrometer, um, it's kind of interesting. But, but basically, the way this instrument works is similar on the front end to a reactor-based diffractometer. Okay, we have a beam that's defined and it's monochromated. There's a monitor. There are masks. Um, there's a, a sample sitting in some sample environment. A filter, which again, depending how one is using the instrument, could be on the front end or the back end. But now, the scattered neutron beam, in addition to being monochromated on the front end, the scattered end is now analyzed for energy. Okay. So there's three axes. There's a monochromator axis, a sample axis, and an analyzer axis. That's the triple axis spectrometer. And finally, it has a detector. And up here, you see a more modern example of a triple axis. Um, this is the HB1 triple axis spectrometer at Oak Ridge. So there's the monochromator drum, which is the big shielding around it. This opening here is where the neutrons are coming out. And as this is set up, I can see that there's a collimator there and a monitor. And actually, that's a pyrolytic graphite filter. And uh, sort of almost invisible in this picture, there's, <laughs> there is a sample uh, sitting there. 
and over here is where the analyzer crystal is, and the detector would be housed here. Okay, so this is a fairly simple instrument in principle. Here's a cartoon of another such instrument um, that illustrates, okay, neutrons coming in, perhaps through a guide, diffracting off a monochromating crystal, being collimated. There might be a diaphragm here to, to sort of mask the beam down to the right size. Some sort of filter. This again showing it on the incident side, although typically actually that's not the way these instruments would be used. Um, a monitor, a sample sitting in some sample environment, a beam stop, more diaphragms, and here's a uh, crystal analyzer, and finally a detector, or maybe more than one detector, or maybe a position sensitive detector. Okay, fairly simple instrument. Now again, uh, monochromators. The same kind of considerations that I mentioned before are even as true or more true here. Um, the most typical monochromator that's used is piloted graphite 002 reflection because it's just a very strong scatterer. Okay, it also scatters all the harmonics, so if one is going to use it, we have to filter out those harmonics, and I'll get to that in a second. Um, for short wavelengths, one might use copper or beryllium. Okay, for higher energy neutrons, uh, if you really want to get rid of second order, you might use something like silicon or germanium. Okay. And there are all kinds of other monochromators that one might consider using. Now, uh, there is one aspect of this that uh, is probably better to understand if we use a whiteboard. So let me go to that. All right. <clears throat> so again, this what this experiment is is it's a basic. Okay, we have Ki. We have a sample. We have Kf. We have Ei. We have Ef. Right, and then we have Q, and we have E, which is equal to. Uh, EI minus EF, or, you know, I've been calling it omega, so we have omega. Okay, I typically want to run this experiment in a way where I fix something like Q or E. The most common thing is fixing Q, which Brockhaus did, and I make a measurement where Q is, oops, where I fix, say, Q, sorry, I fix E, I fix I'm fixed in a pickle. Let's erase that. I fix Q. And Q is a vector. Okay? And I vary E, and I measure the intensity as a function of E. Okay? And I may thereby get a peak, and then I can repeat this for another Q, and so on. And I'll get a peak where I might have an allowed excitation of, of uh, the sample. Well, in order to do this, right, this will only work if I simultaneously adjust at least two of those three angles. So typically the way I work is I will either fix the incident energy, and that's fixing Ki, or I will fix the final energy, that's fixing Kf. Now I'm going to suggest that you look in the book of Sharani and Axon Tranquata for the details, although the Brookhaven method was usually the, the different convention than what I'm going to suggest. But one issue that comes up here is that the monitor counter um, has an efficiency of sort of 1 over V like other detectors. And the cross section has something that looks like Ki over Kf. And it turns out if I fix Kf, that 1 over V cancels out Ki. And I sort of get a straightforward measurement of something that's very proportional to S of Q and omega, right? And if I fix EF, that works very nicely. If I fix EI, um, that doesn't quite work, and then I get a sort of messy dependence of, if you like, uh, the signal or resolution function as a function of varying EF. But I'm going to leave as an exercise for you, and I'll define this. For a given set of EIs or EFs, I want you to work out what angles in the spectrometer are necessary to keep Q fixed while I vary energy. 
And this was a thing that Brockhaus worked out and automated back in the 1960s, gave himself a huge advantage over everybody, and uh, allowed him to be the first person to measure things like phonon dispersion relations, etc. Now I see. Okay, back we go. Well, having said all that, if I have a, uh, a monochromator and I fix the final energy, that monochromator will have harmonics, and the harmonics are in the incident beam, right? Because I can't filter the incident beam because I want to vary it. So if I measure sort of the uh, monitor counts as a function of energy and their efficiency, it will vary depending on whether uh, or if I measure the ratio relative to the true ratio of the, the, the right incident energy, that will vary depending what the energy is. So I haven't explained this very well, but the bottom line is if I want to use the monitor counter to normalize things, I have to understand stuff like how much harmonic contamination there might be for a nominal incident energy. Okay, so this is just an experimental consideration. Um, here's an example of one of the triple axes at Oak Ridge. This is HB3 which is a thermal triple axis, and you can see it has a choice of graphite, beryllium, or silicon monochromators that you can get automatically. These happen to be vertically focused, so you can focus the beam down on the sample. There's a range of accessible angles and so on and so forth, and, and uh, you can go online and you can read all about it. Um, we also have a spectrometer on the cold source. You can see a picture of this. It's actually something that was partially moved from Brookhaven under the auspices of the US-Japan Cooperative Program. You can see it has a different range of incident energies. Okay, a triple axis on a cold source will typically be used to look at smaller energies with higher resolutions. Okay, and uh, finally, we have an instrument HB1A that was originally built by Ames Lab in cooperation with Oak Ridge. And this is sort of a modified triple axis that has a fixed incident energy. It turns out the fixed incident energy is 14.7 millivolts, which is very, very convenient for uh, pyrolytic graphite filters by some no complete non-coincidence. Um, so let's think about a couple of other aspects of this that you should be aware of. First of all, uh, there are a couple of, there are a few advanced triple axis spectrometers around. I just have written down a couple here. Um, that you might be interested in looking up. One of them is called RITA2, and it's at PSI, which is in Switzerland. That's Paul Scherer Institute. And uh, RITA stood for reinvent the triple axis. And they, use, in RITA, used a velocity selector as a filter and some other things, a position-sensitive detector. It's interesting to look at. Another one is the MAX spectrometer that happens to be at NIST. And I will tell you that if you go to the FRM2 website, they have a combination triple axis and spin echo spectrometer. And after you've had the lectures on spin echo, it might be of great interest to look at that. So there are some things that are much more elaborate than what I've talked about. There's another point about this that I would like you to be aware of. And that is that triple axis spectrometers, the basic principle is we vary Q and E, and we have a lot of flexibility in doing that. And we pick one Q or E and make a measurement there, varying the other one. And if we see a peak, we have an excitation, et cetera. But there are ways to get spurious peaks that look like excitations, but they're really sort of a background effect. Okay, they even have a name for them. They're called spurions. So what, what, how's, how would you get a spurion? Well, think about this harmonic contamination that might not be completely filtered out. If I have an, an incident energy, which I'll call E0, I also have 40 naught. I also have 90 naught. And those are all going to bounce off of the monochromator crystal going in the same direction, right? Then I have a sample, and it'll scatter some neutrons. And uh, it'll scatter neutrons, and those might bounce off the analyzer crystal. Well, the analyzer crystal will have EF, 4EF, 9EF, etc. Okay, those all go in the same direction. So let's imagine that the sample has some elastic scattering that might be incoherent or whatever. Right? That scattering is usually pretty strong compared to the inelastic scattering. So if I happen to have a match between any of these guys and any of those, like say 4E0 is equal to 9EF, 
right? I will have something that scatters elastically from the monochromator, the sample, and the analyzer, and I'll get a peak there. You know, that peak is coming from this elastic scattering, but it's at a point that I think is nominally inelastic. Okay, these are so-called dangerous energies. You can calculate what they are, and you can shift them by measuring at different EIs or ES. But it is an example of a spurion. So this spurion would be called Bragg incoherent Bragg. Oops, it's incoherent from the sample. Bragg from here. You can also have Bragg Bragg incoherent or incoherent Bragg Bragg. You can get spurious scattering. Okay, so that's something to keep in mind. So, uh, okay, well, the pulse source, I'm going to, if I want to do inelastic scattering, I will have to define an incident energy, all right? So here's a typical pulse source inelastic machine. This is called a Fermi chopper spectrometer. It's an example of what we call a direct geometry spectrometer which means, in this case, a monochromatic beam is hitting the sample. So we produce a spectrum from a moderator. We get rid of the prompt pulse with a T0 chopper. And now, instead of using, we could use disk choppers, but I'm showing here something different called a Fermi chopper. This is like a rotating curved collimator, rotating about a vertical axis. And if you think about it for a second, only neutrons of precisely the right velocity and phase relative to this will get through such a rotating chopper. And it's called a Fermi chopper because it was invented by guess who? And uh, this monochromates the beam. So it's monochromatic on one side. And once you have a little monochromatic beam, once it strikes the sample, right, you know the distance it takes to get there or the time it takes to get there. And then depending on the sample to detector distance, at any given detector, you will know what the resulting energy of the scattered neutron that arrives in that detector is. Okay, so this is a very simple device. And uh, it allows one to measure. Here's an example of what one of these things looks like in practice. This is the Sequoia chopper spectrometer at SNS. <coughs> Neutrons are coming from here. You can see there's a guide uh, deep in here, a T0 chopper deep in the shielding. Um, you know, down here there's a Fermi chopper. It turns out this has a very impressive detector tank that when it's all filled out will have 40 square meters of detectors. 40 square meters, and it's about 250 cubic meters of a vacuum system. That's a lot of pumping, right? And basically, you have a sample and, and a very large array of linear position sensitive detectors. <coughs> now, the reactor triple axis, typically you're measuring at 1Q and omega. With one of these instruments, at any given point in detector space, okay, if you, if you think about a monochromatic beam coming in, striking the sample, going in some fixed direction, hitting a detector, I will measure all the different lengths of KF or all the different scattered energies that go there. Okay, these occur at different values of Q for the same reason as the diagram I showed you earlier. And they kind of follow a parabolic trajectory through Q and omega space. But if I add all these detectors up together, I get a large volume in Q and omega space. And I can, in fact, get a great deal of information at one time. Okay, so here's uh, Sequoia. Sequoia actually is a Fermi chopper that has a very high resolution and a relatively long flight path from the sample to the detector allows that. It has a companion arcs that uh, here you see the arcs detector array and here's a cartoon of arcs. Arcs has a shorter flight path so it has a smaller resolution but it covers a much wider range of angles. And in practice you can also tune the resolutions of these instruments by spinning the Fermi chopper at different speeds and at a different phase relative to the incoming neutron pulse. Right? So there's quite a bit of flexibility in these instruments as well. Um, now, we're at 5.15, so let me just say a couple of words about spurious scattering from chopper spectrometers. If I go back, here uh, I don't have any harmonics in the incident beam. Because I'm monochromating using this Fermi chopper, it gets rid of them. I don't have Bragg reflection. But what I can have is if I have neutrons that follow a slightly different path than the neutrons I think I'm counting, I can have elastic scattering, say, from the sample. It goes up and hits some container that the sample's held in. And if it accidentally gets scattered towards the detector, it will have arrived 
at a different time than just a regular elastically scattered neutron. It's followed a different path length. Okay, since it's arrived at a different time, the computer says, aha, you've got an energy transfer, so you're a non-zero energy transfer, you're some sort of excitation, and you can also see a peak in the spectrum, but in fact it's coming from elastic scattering from some other junk. So part of the trick here is you want to cover up anything that might scatter neutrons with some shielding to eliminate that and get the background down. Okay. So uh, I guess, again, I'll recommend you to go look at these Fermi chopper spectrometers. And I will simply point out, I'm going to stop here because of the time, but I will point out that there are several other kinds of instruments that I'm now not going to cover. But in particular, there's a um, backscattering spectrometer, which is an example of an indirect geometry spectrometer, where the incident beam of the sample is a white beam and the scattered beam is monochromated. Right? And you can find these at SNS if you go read the instrument sheets. Um, there's a cold neutron chopper spectrometer that uses a combination of various different choppers. That's rather interesting, and it's used for higher resolution measurements. Spin echo, you'll hear about from Roger Penn. And uh, then we have a hybrid spectrometer called HiSpec that kind of combines a chopper spectrometer with the triple axis and has elements of both. So uh, I guess I've been going for close to 75 minutes, and I hope you'll pardon the little interruptions that we had. Uh, but I think I can stop here. You can see a little bit about these other instruments in the notes, and I'll ask if you have any questions. Okay, are there any questions from any of the remote sites? You can type them in quickly and I'll, I'll do my best to answer them. Okay, well, seeing none, I, yes? Okay, so the question is, are arcs and sequoia pretty much the same? And the answer is, in a sense, yes, they are. The main differences are this. Sequoia has a longer flight path and it covers a smaller angular range. So what that means is that sequoia, if used in an identical fashion, <coughs> will have a better energy resolution because the flight path is longer. And since it concentrates on lower angles, um, it basically is concentrating typically on smaller values of Q. Right? And if you think about it for a minute, if I have magnetic excitations, the cross section tells us that the intensity of magnetic excitations is higher at small Q, typically. But if I have vibrational or phonon excitations, at least over a wide range, the intensity of those excitations is higher at large Q. So ARCS covers a wider angular range with a little less resolution. So it has very good signals, but it goes out to larger Q. Those larger Qs may not be of such interest if you're concentrating on magnetism, but if you're concentrating on phonons, they are. So uh, the sort of stereotypical view would be that you might use ARCS to measure phonons and sequoia to measure magnetic excitations. But in practice, actually, people use both <laughs> uh, interchangeably depending on whether they want better resolution or, or better signal and depending whether they need the high Q data or not. Okay, so, you know, again, uh, this is one of those things where every experiment you have to think a little bit about what might be the optimal instrument. But the principle of operation is the same in the same sense that these other triple axis instruments the principle of operation is the same, and the details are a little different. But in terms of success of the experiment, of course, the details can be important. Okay, but a, a good question. Okay, any other questions? Right. Well, thank you very much. I hope uh, this has been a little bit useful and enjoyable for you, and uh, and I hope you enjoy the rest of the course. <laughs>